welcome to chapter four of uh, Transgender Ideology, uh, Ideology and Gender Dysphoria, A Catholic Response. Uh, chapter four is dealing with the question of intersex. So we're dealing with intersex uh, this time. And whereas in the past, each subsection had gotten its own video, the subsections within this uh, chapter are more cohesive. They're, they're all the same topic rather than uh, culture, which has many aspects to it. Uh, this is dealing with uh, the, the science and philosophy of intersex. So uh, we'll do it all together. So the first part I'll t touch on is probably the most controversial, the one, the topic of intersex ideology. Uh, and if you recall back a uh, couple of sections ago, when we dealt with men and male and female, he created them, the document from the Congregation for Catholic Education. It talked about transgender and intersex ideology, right? It, for, for most people, that's probably, not to say triggering, but, <laughs> but it's somewhat triggering, even for somebody like me who I was in, you know, researching this for a little while, and then I see transgender uh, intersex ideology and I kind of cringed right that kind of a cringe say oh what is the church talking about now could they possibly intersex is clearly not an ideology right uh, intersex is a biological condition it's an abnormality right it might be unfortunate but it's not certainly not an ideology right you're either intersex or you are not intersex uh, how does this uh, play into ideology but the more that you read within intersex topics and debates and discussions, the more you are able to determine that there is, in fact, an intersex ideology, right? And I think this makes sense because it, it's also like the transgender, right? Transgender ideology. Yes, there is, in fact, transgender ideology. Most of my book reviews of cr criticizing me uh, are often criticizing saying that there is no such thing as transgender ideology. You are or you aren't, and it's a biological thing. Well, uh, I kind of say that in my book, <laughs> right? But uh, there's a difference between transgender ideology and gender dysphoria. Likewise, there's a difference between intersex ideology and intersex as a sexual disorder, right? There, there, is, a, there is a difference, and people have turned both gender dysphoria, and intersex into ideologies for the purpose of promoting gender theory, right? It's, it's part of fourth wave feminism now. Uh, as part of, uh, just as an example, I know this is three points down uh, on this slide, but some people have used the term LGBTQI plus plus, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the I in LGBTQI is intersex, right? Amnesty International, for one, uses that I in the LGBTQI uh, uh, list, right? Rainbow. How is intersex, right? If LGB are sexual orientations, questioning, I'm not even sure what that is, right? <laughs> but intersex is a biological disorder, right? The same thing you would say with the T in LGBT, right? If transgender is uh, uh, gender dysphoria, then um, how it's not an orientation, right? It, it, it's a medical condition. So again, is this confusing? Absolutely, right? People are blending ideology with uh, with biology, right? There is a, there is a, a philosophizing of biology, and and it's now part of gender theory, right? So, I point this out because it, again, I think it applies also to the transgender issue. Now, people might more easily say, no, transgender is not ideology at all. It's you know, it's. Uh, it's, it's just what it is. And, uh, well, if they can even, even make an ideology out of intersex, then, of course, why couldn't they do it out of gender dysphoria? So the head of the Intersex Society 
in North America. Cheryl Chase says, uh, male, female, uh, binary is not immutable, meaning it can change, right? One can be male and become female, female become male. They are, they can change within a lifetime. Uh, it's not, it's not set, right? It's not set in stone. She makes an even bolder statement. Uh, it furnishes the opportunity to deploy nature strategically to disrupt disrupt heteronormativity heteronormative systems of sex, gender, and sexuality. So to say, well, why does intersex exist? It's to it's to break down the patriarchy. It's to break down the binary system. It's to break down the heteronormativity system. Uh, the idea that male and female are two separate sexes. They can come together uh, in intercourse and create a new life, right? This, this is the natural process. And they're saying, well, intersex breaks down the system, right? It, well, does it break down the system, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a deformity, right? That would, I've used this example later on. You know, it's that some people are born with only one arm, right? Genetic abnormalities, right? Somebody's born with one arm. Does this break down the normativity of two-handed people, <laughs> right? Does somebody born uh, with other uh, congenital disorders, right? Does it break down uh, uh, the normativity of it? No, it's just it's just a disorder, right? It's a dis it's a it's a biological disorder. It doesn't mean they're less of people, but it doesn't mean that the the system is, no longer exists, right? Uh, I'll get into that again a bit later. Uh, you know, people like Cheryl Chase, uh, they're, they're, they have articles in things like the Transgender Studies Reader uh, and calls it Hermaphrodites with Attitude. That's her chapter that she wrote, Hermaphrodites with Attitude. Right? This is not simply looking at a biological disorder. It is now creating a philosophy out of it, an ideology out of it, uh, and using it to break down the, the normativity of uh, sex and gender, right? That's the point, right? So that is ideology, right? It's ideology. Um, you could likewise say that, again, with the transgender issue, you know, that somebody has, ge uh, has gender dysphoria doesn't mean that it is saying that there are a third sex or that sex is not binary it, it doesn't mean any of that right it could just mean it's a it's a it's a disorder right it's a disorder of some kind um but uh, clearly not everyone who is intersex agrees with this so this is cheryl chase's story right this is what she's done with intersex for her uh and there's plenty of people who aren't intersex who would agree with cheryl chase right and and participate in this kind of ideology it's part of the bigger gender ideology. Then there's people like Emmy, uh, who's from the Oregon chapter of Intersex Initiative. And she says, most people born with intersex conditions do view themselves as man or woman with a birth condition like any other, right? So there's some intersex people who are saying, look, I just have a, a birth condition. I'm man, I'm a woman, I'm, you know, <laughs> I, have a, I have a condition. Um, there's no philosophy, right? It's, it's, just, uh, it's just a biological condition that they can treat the best they can medically, right? It's a medical issue, right? If somebody's born with childhood diabetes, it's not a philosophy, it's a medical condition. Likewise with intersex, right? So... No, I've spoken a lot more than I probably needed to, but I, I've been getting so many criticisms against this idea that things are ideology. And I, I think that people are making, you know, the title of the book, Transgender Ideology and Gender Dysphoria. Obviously, I pointed this out at the beginning, but what I'm, po what I'm saying is that there are two distinctions, right? There are two umbrellas. One is ideology and one is a biological condition and... Uh, the church has a stance on ideology and a different stance on people with uh, biological conditions. Right? Uh, both of them are pastoral responses, but you have to approach them differently because ideology is, uh, can be fought with philosophy. And somebody with a medical 
birth defect is treated purely on a pastoral level. Uh, no challenge is needed, right? Uh, you just, what can I do to help? <laughs> um, you don't say, what can I do to help to somebody who is ideologically opposed to you? Because what they would say is give up your ideology, give up everything you stand for and participate in ours, right? We, we can't do that. Um, now, there is something we can learn, though, from intersex, right? That I think there, it opens a door, right? I think it legitimately opens a door to ask certain biological questions, you know, for people who are intersex or gender dysphoric, I think there is a doorway to look at this through the lens of the mutability of lower, lower species. I don't, again, I'm not like Cheryl Chase saying that all sex is immutable. No. <laughs> is it, is sex, immu is sex mutable? Is it changeable? Well, sure, it is. Not for humans, <laughs> right? It is for other species. And, uh, you know, fish, amphibians, reptiles, for example, uh, sex is mutable. Uh, when they're in the womb, they're not sexed. They're not sexed. It, it determined, it's determined by the temperature, uh, the pH levels, the uh, environment. Um, there's all types of things that can affect um, whether it's going to be more male or female that have to do with environment. Now, this is very different than with human beings, right? Because how do human beings determine male or female? Well, we don't start as neutral, right? From the moment of conception, you're either XX or XY. Right, so the, there's a there's a genetic predetermination from conception in humans, not so with amphibians, reptiles, <laughs> and reptiles. Amphibians even uh, can change their sex after they have created a sex. Right, Th this is the the storyline for Jurassic Park. Right, the, the all of the female dinosaurs, some of them can become male. Uh, well, because frogs, this can happen in frogs, right? That, that's the fictional story of Jurassic Park, but it's based on a biological reality that uh, you know, uh, some frogs, they, they could change their sex after they've been hatched, right? From the egg and turned into a tadpole and they could change sex. So there's a mutability within amphibians. Again, what does that have to do with us? <laughs> we are not reptiles or amphibians. That is true. Therefore, we shouldn't overemphasize this idea of mutability. Now, is there any way that some of this could affect us? Perhaps, right? There could be perhaps some influence. And how is this? You know, well, because we still have lizard brains. <laughs> part of our brains are uh, still lizard brains. Uh, part of it is evolutionary baggage, right? So. You know, if you ascribe to evolution, which most Catholics do, I know not all, but the, the church officially has not rejected uh, evolution. Uh, it also doesn't canonize any system, so it doesn't accept it outright, uh, you know, let the science determine it. But from what we know, things like our ability to feel hunger and desire to eat, the desire to have sex, the desire to defecate, right? These very basic living uh, processes are rooted in the same thing that we would have had even before mammals had evolved, right? Uh, before there were even mammals, you know, how a frog experiences hunger or, or pain or needing to go to the bathroom or desiring to mate might be uh, similar to the way we do because it worked, right? Uh, if we look at evolution, things only change, adapt when there is an advantage, right? The, the, the survival of the species, right? The survival of the fittest, right? If there's an advantage to change, then there might be a change, um, right? More of the the productive ones uh, will have offspring and the more their offspring will survive and there'll be more of them than the other kind, right? That's the whole idea with evolution. Um, 
but hunger works <laughs> in lower species. Therefore, why why change it? Right, uh, the desire to mate works. So why change it? Uh, right, some basic some basic brain biology has just carried on. Right, is carried on to all animals. We share it alike. There's nothing wrong with it. Right, the 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 the, the wiring works. Right, if you look back to the uh, you know, the early computers, the Commodore 64. There are probably some elements of the Commodore 64 that is still in my laptop that I'm using here today because it worked, <laughs> right? An example being the keyboard, right? The keyboard works, right? Uh, uh, I can type in uh, the, the location of the, the letters on my keyboard. Uh, it's perfectly a good design. Why redesign the keyboard? Uh, so uh, let's keep that the same, right? Keep it the same. Um, doesn't need to evolve. Um, so do we have any evolutionary baggage left from when we were amphibians and reptiles? Perhaps, right? There's some perhaps some baggage left over. They call it the reptilian brain, if you ever want to look that up. And there's some things within the hypothalamus. We don't know where exactly transgender or intersex or some of these things come from or how they develop. But at least with the transgender issue, the perception is that it's in the hypothalamus. Might deal with gender identity. This this is uh, this could be useful information, right? <laughs> is there any part of the hypothalamus which is left over? Perhaps, right? Perhaps, maybe, or maybe it has nothing to do with, and there's still just genetic abnormalities and hormonal abnormalities, and these things can still come about, right? That's possible too. But it could also be that some of this is, you know, occasionally pops up because it's deep down in the DNA. It's down there somewhere where it could reemerge at times. Uh, let's see. Now, how about are there any of these abnormalities within mammals, right? So they do, the mutability appears within amphibians and reptiles. But how about mammals, right? Not just humans, but other mammals. Well, they found in this is back in 1984 when they injected uh, the female ger gerbil with testosterone during development, uh, caused the hypothalamus, right, in the brain, which probably determines sexu sexual identity and orientation and things like that. Um, it developed more of a male nucleus, a male brain. So uh, the introduction of testosterone in a developing brain can develop a male orientated brain and then the behavior of that gerbil was then male even though it was a female gerbil right so we can know that uh, it's not just enough to be an xx or an xy chromosome um, it's those chromosomes then trigger you go back to male and female in chapter two uh, it triggers a hormone release, which then develops in creating a male or female orientated brain, right? You can override this by injecting testosterone. It, now, if there were ever a situation where male testosterone flooded the female brain during development in the human, right? If there were some natural abnormality where there was more testosterone in the brain than estrogen, this would then presumably trigger a more male orientated brain. You could have somebody who was an XX chromosome, physically female, who had a brain that was orientated like a male if testosterone were in the brain during the spe specific periods of human development, right? Question is, could that happen? Does that happen? Um, there was another case uh, that they studied where uh, in the womb, uh, a female mouse lying between two male developing mice, uh, she would have higher testosterone levels and lower estrogen levels than a mouse that was in the womb next to other female mice. Uh, so just being in proximity in the womb to somebody of the opposite uh, hormonal type could influence uh, development. And that female who acted who had higher testosterone and lower estrogen rates was more aggressive like the males and was less sexually interesting to the male male gerbils 
um, or mice, mice in this case. Uh, so the, in the womb, hormone, hormones have an effect on the brain and on the chemistry of, uh, of the person, right? So at least within some mammals, right? Uh, we don't do these types of tests on humans, right? We don't do this on humans because it would be unethical. But there's sometimes, you know, and we don't often know these things like intersex or transgender. We don't know these things until years later and we weren't going and messing around in the womb before they were born. So we don't really know, you know, we can't really study it as things were happening to say, look what, you know, look at this interesting thing. I, let's see how it turns out. We we don't we don't mess around with human uh embryos and fetuses in the wombs of their mother, right? We, we don't mess around with that. Uh, perhaps sometime in the future, if technology were better and we could be assured that, um, you know, it's not going to do any damage, uh, maybe that might happen. But at this point, we don't, we don't do that. Now, on intersex, you know, intersex can mean so many things, right? It, it, it like transgender, is an umbrella, right? There's, there are some similarities between intersex and transgender. So there's an umbrella term, right, intersex. It, there's not one type of disorder which creates intersex. There are many, right, dozens of disorders which create intersex. Because of that, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion, right? There can be a lot of discussion of, of rates and things like that, right, depending on what you mean, right? Because if all we... Uh, if all we meant by intersex was uh, Klinefelter syndrome, then we can kind of narrowly define it and know exact numbers. But, you know, as an umbrella, it's a little less clear. So somebody with Klinefelter syndrome has 47 chromosomes instead of the regular 46. So they might be XXY. So XX is female, XY is male. What do you do with an XXY or uh, XYY, right? That That would be clearly more more male with two wives uh, but these are abnormalities right you, you don't expect 47 chromosomes right and it affects one in every 1,000 births uh, approximately and in this picture here it's the person on the bottom left which has the, the Klinefelter syndrome um, disorder in men uh, is external male genitalia small testes infertility at a greater height, greater height, poor uh, conditions, uh, and lower than average intelligence, and perhaps breast growth, usually at puberty. So tall, smaller testes, infertile, and at teenage years, the development of some breasts. But some people don't even know that they have this disorder uh, until they get married and they try to have children, and it turns out they're infertile. Right, so if you have a disorder where you're intersex, but nobody, you don't even know you have it until you're 25 or 30, right? Uh, then it's intersex, but it's not. Well, this is a third sex. No, it's very clearly male, right? Uh, other than the addition of some breast development, uh, otherwise. Um, uh, male, right? If a person were uh, XXY, uh, right, the Y chromosome, you know, the same thing, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's unusual, right? It's unusual, but this is an unusual situation where a, a third chromosome is available, right? Uh, Down syndrome is another one where there's an extra chromosome, right? Th these, does it make Down syndrome people a third? Uh, a new species of human beings, right? It's, it's somebody who has Down syndrome. It's a syndrome. No less of a person, <laughs> but also not a new species or a new sex or a new something else. It's just uh, within the, the natural variations of human beings, and it's an abnormality, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a disorder uh, in a way. Right. Then there's Turner syndrome, which is more noticeable, right? If you've seen somebody with this, they have kind of have the webbed neck uh, that um, on TV, if you keep up with pop culture, I think uh, Big Ed, uh, he had uh, um, Turner syndrome. Um, so this one's the opposite. So uh, 
Kleinfelter's had 47 instead of 46 chromosomes. This time that you have 45 instead of 46. So you just have an X chromosome or a Y chromosome, or you might have a, an X plus a little bit more, or Y plus a little bit more, but you're missing a, a chromosome, or at least part of a chromosome. Uh, it affects one in every 2,000 to 3,000 uh, people, uh, female births. Um, right, some of the Y chromosome is absent. Uh, there's not enough to cause male sexual features. Right, So if a person is X and a little bit of Y, then the male features don't fully form. Um, they don't have sh short web neck lower set ears, shorter than average stature, swollen hands and feet at birth, and they are generally infertile. Um, they more frequently have heart defects, diabetes, uh, or hypothyroidism. Right? Uh, so, you know, this is clearly a disorder. It's nothing, okay, nothing against the person, but it's not it's not saying, well, there's male, and then there's female, and then there's intersex, and the, you know these people are breaking down the binary. Not really. This is a terrible disorder, right? <laughs> right? This is this is um, uh, right, uh, Down syndrome would be similar, right? It, it, it's um, it's nothing wrong with the person, but they're they're it's they're not halfway between two things. It's just a disorder, right? Uh, it's a, uh, the androgen insensitivity syndrome, which has CA, CAIS, which is complete android sensitivity, insensitivity syndrome, and PA, PAIS, which is partial, right? So it affects differently. So it occurs once in every 13,000 births, even more rare than the other ones. Um, this disorder in women affects one of the X chromosomes, which makes women the carrier. Now, this one um, is kind of an interesting one because when women get it, they have they are typically taller than average. Uh, they are thinner, um, and they have uh, less hair, uh, and it delays puberty. Um, so essentially, they look like a Barbie doll, right? So. If you look at this person who looks like a tall, thin, beautiful, hairless woman, uh, you wouldn't say, oh, that person is a, a hermaphrodite, <laughs> right? Using the old term. The person would just look like a very beautiful, stereotypical woman. She could be a model, for example. Well, she could say carrier. So it doesn't really negatively affect females, the androgen insensitivity. But in males, it does have... Uh, uh, a negative effect. So, um, so the entire, what it means is that the, the male can't absorb testosterone. In complete androgen insensitivity, they don't absorb any testosterone, and partially they absorb some testosterone, but not enough. So, uh, so in extreme cases, right, complete androgen insensitivity, a complete female genitalia forms, uh, and there's Partially or fully undescended testes, a short vagina, no cervix for the male. Uh, so a female sexual development occurs, even though the person is XY, they are male, but because they can't absorb testosterone, the female body type takes place, right? So. The X, and maybe this is to clear thing, to try to clear things up. You know, we say, well, you're the X, X, or X, Y. That only really sets, that only determines the triggering of the initial hormones within the person. And the triggering of those hormones then creates the morphology of the body. The hormones in development have far more to do with than just the, uh, the genes, right? The, the genes should trigger a certain progression, but they are like a blueprint. Uh, it's the actual uh, hormones, which are the builders of the building, right? The hormones are the builders. Uh, you could have an office builder, you're going to have a house, right? <laughs> it depends on the builders, right? The blueprints should match what the builders build, but the reality is what the builders build, not the blueprints, right? You say, well, this is, should be an office building. Well, the blueprints say it's a house. Well, 
It's nice that the blueprints say it should be a house, but it's actually an office building because that's what the builders built. The partial is just less, right? Uh, you know, so if you were male, born X Y, you were X Y chromosomes, and you had complete androgen and sensitivity, sensitivity, you would appear entirely female, right? If you had complete androgen and sensitivity, you'd be born, and everyone would assume you are a female. You would. Your brain would have also been bathed in estrogen during development, so you would likely think like a female, right? You would have a female brain, a female intersex brain. Partial, you might less likely appear like a convincing woman if in that regard because you still had some testosterone, right? You had some testosterone and some estrogen. So it depends on the range, right? How much insensitivity did you have in your partial insensitivity? Right. Does this then mean that, well, it means sex is a spectrum. Well, you're talking about this occurs one in every 13,000 people. It really doesn't affect the females. So one in every 26,000 people are male where there's uh, an effect. So one in every 26,000 males. We wouldn't call this common, right? It's not, not unthinkable, right? <laughs> It's quite a few people with it, but you know, for people who have complete androgen insensitivity, who are male, it's rare, right? Very rare. Um, when ninety-nine point nine percent of people are born, and they just have typical sexuality, typical uh, creation of their sexual development, one in twenty-six thousand uh, doesn't. Uh, mean that there's all of a sudden now a third sex, right? <laughs> this would be kind of an exaggeration or say, well, it's just a spectrum. Well, not really. When you have 99.9% .9 of people who are here and here, the one dot in the middle doesn't really make a spectrum, <laughs> right? A rainbow you can think of as a spectrum, right? Color in the rainbow is a spectrum. Right? If you ever seen a rainbow, you see the colors, right? This would be, not be a colors. It's rather binary with a random dot in the middle, right? It's a, uh, and then in, in that regard too, the male that had the complete androgen and sensitivity would appear female, would believe that they are female, unless a doctor does a DNA test, they would assume the person is female. Um, infertility would come in, but um, uh, the person would identify under as a binary sex, right? It, it, perhaps with the partial androgen insensitivity, somebody might say, I don't really know, right? <laughs> they might be confused at this because they're having some of both features, right? That could be uh, the challenging one. The androgenital syndrome, I know this is extremely rare, and when I was writing it, um, writing on this, uh, one of the monks where I was writing, he, he said, he told me, well, some people are intersex and they m can menstruate out their penis. And I thought, this is one of those tales that a monk would tell, <laughs> right? This is one of those tales that, you know, oh, that's very nice, Father Giles. I don't think so, but okay, right? If somebody told you, you know, if you're walking down the street and somebody tells you, oh yeah, do you know that some men can menstruate out their penises? You would go, no, I don't think so, right? <laughs> Say, nice try, try again. Until a medical doctor repeated it <laughs> uh, at a conference I was at, uh, who is the one who told Father Giles this to begin with, and this is a medical doctor, very uh, very serious person, not a, not a quack. <laughs> uh, and he said that there are some people with XX chromosomes, there's a cortisol defect uh, with so there's no feedback loop so they develop as a male they, they they make androgens which testosterone so they make testosterone so it's kind of the complete opposite of the last one right they make testosterone uh, and they form uh, male external genitalia even though they are xx chromosomes but if you were to force the female hormone this is usually kind of artificial if you were to force the female hormone on them saying you know you are really a woman right uh, if they were to receive female hormones they would then start to menstruate and they would try to menstruate out their penis since that's all they have uh, but this is somewhat artificial right um, 
the menstruating part because uh, naturally it would uh, be like the CAS right uh, they would be like them in that they had developed entirely with the influence of testosterone when they were XX so they would appear male they would interact male they would think male right everything would be male about them um, other than their genetics right their genetics would still say XX now you know a lot of people who say well this is you know transgender it's just biology right there's you're the xx or xy well there are abnormalities right it, it, we're living in reality right it would be easier to be like no they're just making it up no in reality abnormalities sexual abnormalities may exist could some of this be rooted back to our evolutionary baggage of sexual mutability in lower species maybe right there might be some baggage that allows for genetic abnormalities within us doesn't mean it's sex is mutable it doesn't mean you know everything's a spec doesn't mean any of that but could sometimes these things exist absolutely we know they do right we know they do it's called intersex <laughs> they do occur right and it doesn't mean that we follow intersex ideology but there is a biological intersex condition the last one that I'll cover is ovotestes, which is called true hermaphroditism. That was the traditional term for it, where a person is really born with what appears to be both sets of genitalia, right? The hermaphrodite would be somebody who has all the genitalia um, traditionally. That, well, that's ovotestes, right? It's one kind. Only 5% of all people who are intersex are ovotestes, uh, uh, occurs once in every 83,000 births, right? It's very rare, although when you figure 350, uh, 320 million Americans, right? There is a reasonable number of them, right? We're talking about hundreds of people who have this. It's not um, not unthinkable. It's just not common, right? not a common thing. Uh, the most common phenomenon occurs in two, uh, when two sperm fertilize one egg. Right? This is the most common way that this occurs. So you really have two individuals in the womb right? at, the, at the very fir mo first moments. Two eggs get fertilized, and it, you could create twins, right? That, that could be twins. Uh, but if they fuse together, you could have, you know, we, we know sometimes people are born with maybe an extra leg or something, right? Part of their twin was attached to them. Um, well, if they perfectly fuse, you end up with two individuals within one body, which then could create, you know, if one was XX and one is XY and they were to fuse together, now you have one individual that is both XX and XY. And there are even some examples where if you test some cells in the body, they're XX, and test other cells in the same body, you'll have XY. They are truly a, an, an amalgamation of two bodies. Uh, and if they were both male, you might not even notice. Right? Both female, you might not even notice. If it was one male and one female and they fused together, you could end up with ovotestes, uh, which creates this abnormality, right? It's an abnormality. Again, does this mean that there is a third sex? One in 83,000 births and it has pretty negative effects on the person which doesn't continue on to the next generation if they could even reproduce and probably they can't um, this is not a new species of person it's not a new kind of person it's a birth defect right it's a congenital disorder uh, that's all we can really say about it um, I'll get into some of the challenges later um, now the rates again it, I did the rates for each one of these individually, and there's more, right? There's dozens of these. I gave the most common, some of the most common ones uh, for uh, intersex. Uh, some of these were, right, too many chromosomes, too few chromosomes. Some of these were not ability to absorb testosterone, not ability to absorb uh, estrogen, or two eggs fused together, right? These are very different causes right there are multiple cause, causes for intersex right it's not just one thing right it's not just one one thing a, a genetic thing or something like that 
So there's also then a wide range of rates. So some people who are part of trying to promote trans, uh, uh, intersex ideology, which probably means they promote uh, transgender ideology and gendered, uh, ide uh, gendered ideology in general, uh, would try to maximize the number, right? You say, you know, well, the physicians estimate one in every 2,500 uh, children are born intersex. Uh, Dr. Ann Fausto Sterling from Brown University says the rate of one in 60, right? Right. So if, if one in 60 are intersexed or have a disorder of sexual development, you could say, well, see, this isn't very rare, right? One in 60 is not that rare. You know, maybe sex is a spectrum, right? You, you have male and female, but one in 60 is in between that, you know, that's a fairly sizable population of people. If you multiply that by the 320 million Americans, you know, what would be one in 60 out of 320 million? Well, uh, quite a few, right? A million, we're talking about millions of people. Um, well, that, that, that's, again, a little bit part of moving the ideology aside, because when people are, when people hear intersex, what they're often thinking is ovo testes, which is one in 83,000 births. They're not thinking Kleinfelder syndrome where you could be 25 years old and not even know you're intersex, <laughs> right? Some, some of these intersex, you know, uh, Turner syndrome, you know, some of these, you, you could have them and not even for your entire life know that you had them. So sure, you're intersex, but uh, it's resulted in infertility. Well, well, how intersex are you? You're not really breaking down the sexual binary. Uh, not really. It's not really what's happening. Um, so it's fairly rare, right? And the more extreme forms of intersex are extremely rare, right? That would be fair enough to say. Um, and the the sad part is, you know, some of these things they can test for now, uh, and uh, the majority, I think it's 58% of children who they're able to see this, that the person might have Kleinfelder's or uh, Turner syndrome, they're aborted. Right. They, uh, so that's the irony is the people who promote, well, see sex is a, a spectrum. Well, they're also probably the fastest to abort them when, <laughs> when they don't meet the binary system. Right. Uh, that, that's a bit of the irony. The people who promote the spectrum theory, once they see something outside of the out of the binary, they kill it. Right. They abort it. Uh, it's not the conservative Christians who are aborting their children. Right, probably not. Right, it, it would be people who would be more liberal. Right, more liberal people would be more likely be open to aborting their children, especially ones that have birth defects. And the, the irony is, they would also be the ones who might support the idea that uh, sex is a spectrum. Right. <laughs> so it's a spectrum, and as long as it's somebody else's child, when it's your child, you only want binary children. <laughs> That's the irony. Um, uh, anyway, kind of a tragic thing. So he, some of the responses, right? So what's the response? You know, some of the history stuff might, might not be that interesting to some people. But, you know, in the ancient world, intersex people existed. Uh, people like uh, Gaius Pliny, uh, he, he recalled that the emperor Romulus uh, would drown hermaphrodites. Right? They were seen as an omen that would drown them. But then they also used them in part of uh, the orgies, right? The orgies and the prostitution of the temple, right? Because they're kind of an abnormality, right? Uh, kind of a, when you get tired of just men or just women, you know, go for a little bit of both at the same time, right? They're talking about ancient Rome. Uh, why not? Um, so that, you know, in some ways that hasn't changed, right? So what do we do with transgender people today? Well, people either dr kill them, right? They drown them as monsters or they treat them as prostitutes, right? So some things don't, haven't changed. Uh, uh, Theodore Krebs, uh, he says, well, whatever your, your gonads say you are, that's what you are, right? That would be more the modern approach would be, uh, Gonadally, do you have testes or ovaries? If it's ovaries, you're a female. If you're testes, you're a male. Right? That was kind of a traditional approach. 
Now the Aristotelian or the Thomistic approach uh, would say action follows being. Uh, as a result, you know, if you can give birth with from within your own body, that makes you a female. Uh, if you procreate outside of your body, then you're a male, right? So uh, if you can impregnate people, you're male. And if you can get become pregnant, you're a female, right? It doesn't matter. X, 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 Y doesn't really matter at all. From a Thomistic perspective, the question is uh, pregnancy, right? Pregnancy. How do you get, how do you procreate? That's the, that's the question. Now, when, for people who are infertile, now that creates a different question, right? This is a bit of a, the philosophical question then. Um, then you kind of have to look at the totality of the person, right? Uh, well, are they physically more male or more female? Kind of psychologically, are they more male or are they more female? How they express themselves, is it more male or more female? Um, how do they relate to people within the same or opposite sex, right? How do they relate in the world? These as a totality, right? The, the totality of the person uh, kind of indicates what you are, right? So action follows being. So, well, you look like a female, you act like a female, you interact like a, in the world like a female, you're a female, right? Uh, sound like a duck, you walk like a duck, you talk like a duck, you're a duck, right? Uh, that's kind of <laughs> how you would do it from a Thomistic perspective, right? It's not just one thing. You can't just say, well, testes, well, that's it. XY chromosome, that's it. No, it's the totality. It's the chromosomes, it's the hormones, it's the behavior, it's the psychology, it's the morphology. It's all of the above, right? You look at the totality. Um, and the best option now presented by Milton Diamond, who is very respectable. I think he's well liked by everyone of Milton Diamond except for John Money who's dead and nobody likes John Money so um, we'll get into that next chapter um, but he he was kind of an expert in this field and said they were always the old method was if you're born intersex if you're born just pick one right pick one as a child whatever you pick you know it's fine but it's easier to make females than males because you can just cut something off <laughs> and you got a female versus adding something on to make a male. So basically in the 1960s and 70s, 80s, uh, the idea was if you, somebody is born ovo testes or intersex, turn them into female, sex in their view, gender in their view, is socially constructed, right? Where they were from a philosophy and ideology that everybody is neutral and it's just socially constructed. So just make them female, tell them they're a female, they'll be treated as a female, then they will grow up to be female. Right? That's all you need. But this is saying, you know, not really. Uh, <laughs> you need to wait. You need to wait, watch, wait, see how things develop. You know, if they develop female, then they're female, right? Things become clear as a child gets older what they really are, right? Because you don't know what's going on within their brain with intersex conditions, right? Was their brain sitting in a pool of testosterone when they were growing up, so they're going to act more male? Was their brain sitting in a pool of estrogen in development and they're going to act more female? We don't know. We didn't test it because we didn't know they were going to be intersex at the time, right? There's a lot we didn't know. So just wait. So that, for the last 20 years now, has been the general practice it, medically is wait and see, wait and see. Um, this then can, we can start making connections with this in the transgender issue, but I'm going to wait until next chapter to do that. You know, the challenge to this then is, you know, well, here's a challenge to the church. <laughs> in male and female, he created them, uh, the Congregation for Catholic Education Doctrine, they said, uh, the process of identifying sexual identity uh, is made more difficult by the fictitious terms and, uh, known as gender neuter or third gender has an effect of obscuring the facts of the person's sexual structures, determinants, male and female identity. It said uh, a medical science should determine if it's male or female and they should use objective criteria. Well, medical science today in determining male or female of intersex people is to wait and see. 
that's that's what medical sex will do. They will, medical scientists will not rush and say male, female, start cutting off organs, <laughs> cutting off appendages. No, they're not going to do that. They're going to wait until we see, you know, by five years old, six years old, you're going to start to know if the person is more male or female, right? So there's built, so the Congregation for Catholic Education says, let medical science determine. Medical science then says, wait and see and see how the child develops, and then we can make a determination from there. Okay. That's where we're at. <laughs> Wait and see and see how it kind of develops. Another challenge within um, uh, this case is Tia Pisando, uh was intersex. Some people call her transgender, but she was really also claims that she were intersex uh, and is female. And she wanted to become a nun. Well, that becomes an issue with becoming a nun if you say you are transgender. We don't allow men to transition to female and enter convents. Women-only spaces, that's kind of exists to protect women-only spaces. Now, if the person were intersex, what would you do? Right? Tia identifies as female, as intersex, and wants to enter a convent. Not anymore, but at the time, a couple years ago, she was trying to go that route. Would that be allowed by the church if she is intersex and identifies as female and wants to enter a convent? The answer is no, then is she able to enter a men's community, right? If we're saying sex is binary, if we're saying she, this person, Tia, is either male or female. She says she's female. Medical science says let them figure it out when they get older because we don't know, <laughs> right? Then is she female? And if she's not, can she do, can she enter the priesthood, <laughs> right? Uh, this is this is something we don't have an answer for, right? When you have cases one of one in eighty three thousand, what's the chances that they are Catholic? Then what's the chances that they are called to religious life or priesthood? Right? What, what, we don't. This doesn't come up a lot. But the, now that we know more about science, the more we can find out. Oh no, this person is actually XX or XY, or their hormone levels, right? Things they know they didn't test for a hundred years ago. Uh, this will be more and more an issue. Um, and lastly, uh, Megan DeFranza, <coughs> is up at BU, I think, uh, she uh, writes a lot on the intersex issue, and she points out that you know for centuries we've had intersex people, millennia since the beginning of time, we've had intersex people, and we've always found ways to integrate them within our society. But now since this push for medicalization, we're ver we're, you know the, the push now is everybody needs to be medically treated right everyone needs a medical treatment so you know you're male okay get them on the testosterone get them changed get you know turn them into a perfect male always oh, female get them into a perfect female right uh, this is reinforcing the binary system but is there room within the christian tradition and megan de france is a christian um is there room to allow people to be just naturally how they are right it's like you know if there were, could be a cure for down syndrome would we even want it right or is people with the down syndrome a blessing just the way that god made them <laughs> right we do treat some things right we treat diabetes we don't treat people with down syndrome so where does intersex fall on that is it like is, is it a disorder like diabetes or is it a disorder like down syndrome and do we need to medically transition everyone to the, the extreme binary approach, right? That they have to appear in one way so that they can more naturally integrate within society? Or is there room for atypical identities within uh, society and within the Christian tradition, right? So these are discussions, discussion points, right? Uh, we don't have an answer. Church doesn't have an outright answer. Church has a preference a little bit towards get people into one or the other, right? If there's a disorder, get people into one or the other so that they can live a more natural, flourishing life. But uh, there's also this idea that, well, God made people a certain way. Who are we to undo, uh, you know, 
the natural diversity within society, right? You know, maybe maybe it's a beautiful thing that some people are born with unusual sexual uh, uh, developments within intersex, right? Um, okay. Next, we will be moving into the transgender issue from here. This kind of cuts some things out, right? It identifies the ideology, separates it from the biology, but then within the biology, it, it really creates more questions than answers uh, in some ways. And, and the questions aren't meant to mean a conclusion. They're just really meant to be real questions. Uh, but we'll look at this when we get into the science more. Okay. 